Welcome back to The Black Table. My name is Greg Carr, your host. And today we are going to have a conversation about the global pandemic and its impact and effect on education in general and historically black colleges and universities uh, in particular, and also the impact on non-white students in the United States and beyond. And we're gonna have it with three uh, major master teachers at historically black colleges and universities. And this will be an ongoing conversation with uh, these scholars, these teachers, and uh, our comrades at historically black universities as part of our regular HBCU Educators Roundtable. So uh, the global pandemic has really disrupted all of our institutions in one way or another. And education, which is the foundational institution upon which human society is built in so many ways, has uh, not escaped. Uh, many, like NYU Business uh, School professor Scott Galloway, has said that COVID has simply accelerated trends in higher education. Uh, it hasn't just disrupted, it has accelerated, not only in higher education, and, but in K-12 education as well. So we thought that for our initial HBCU Master Teacher uh, Roundtable, Educator Roundtable, we would invite three of the best in the business. So today we'll be having this conversation on COVID and its impact with uh, Dr. Katherine Adams, who is an associate professor in the Department of uh, African and African American Studies at Claflin University in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Dr. Mario Beatty, who is an associate professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. And Dr. Valethea Watkins, who is also an associate professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University and director of Howard University's Graduate Women's Studies uh, Certificate Program. So welcome colleagues, welcome to the Black Table. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Thank to see you. everybody. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Colleagues. <laughs> so it's, good to, it's good to be seen. <laughs> good to be seen and not viewed. That's right. <laughs> so we, which is uh, a little bit of gallows humor, unfortunately, but we know that uh, we are all, uh, we've all been in this in this profession for quite some time. Uh, everyone, the, between the four of us, we've got well over a century of experience at just about every level of education. So I'm going to start with this, and we're just going to have a bit of a conversation today. Um, anybody have any striking stories as it relates to COVID regarding yourself, your colleagues, and maybe how you or your, uh, or your students have been impacted the most? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think for me, in terms of what I've seen in students, I have noticed a tremendous amount of more uh, mental health issues um, being expressed uh, by students uh, to me um, orally and in writing. Um, I think that for students, uh, perhaps not being on campus, not seeing their friends, uh, being more isolated um, at home, uh, all of us, I think uh, the isolation, the kind of the, the breakdown of the bonds of community has impacted all of us, but I have seen that impact um, in, in my classes. So I uh, constantly am getting students um, that are uh, depressed, um, that are asking for um, uh, longer extensions to complete assignments because they are just tired, fatigued. They're dealing with a range of family issues like all of us meaning that many of their family members have caught COVID. I've had a student where multiple members of their family members uh, caught COVID around the same time or in the hospital. Like all of those issues, the emotionality of all of that um, and the stress that comes from that is tremendously um, impacting uh, student outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we don't discuss that very much. I mean, it's like, when you come into the classroom, it's like, okay, all things considered, um, <clears throat> here's the work, you do the work, you get your grade. But we have to be sensitive as professors to this whole range of external issues and circumstances 
that is beyond any of our control that is impacting dynamics in the classroom. And there's no way that we can escape it and we have to face it. But more so for me, um, it's, it's changed me fundamentally too. Hmm. Um, because in this environment as a professor, um, you have to be more flexible. Hmm. Uh, I, I think this, it calls for that. You have to be uh, more empathetic. You have to be more understanding. You have to be more supportive. And when I say flexible, that means that for me in the classroom, that deadlines or hard deadlines are not as important uh, for me as they were before COVID. Um, and I tell students to reach out to me if they are having problems. Um, and to be honest, and they don't have to go into specifics, but just tell me you're having a problem. And uh, 10 times out of 10, I am going to work with that student. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because that's the type of flexibility that we need um, in order to get us all through this moment. And I think that the focus should be on intellectual growth and development uh, and not so much punishment, you know, for not meeting these strict deadlines because, you know, COVID is raging outside. I mean, you can't, we can't pretend that this is impacting uh, academic instruction in our institutions negatively. We just can't pretend that. Mm. And so I'm not going to. So uh, I have, uh, I learned that lesson very quickly. Mm. And I think that served me well mm. because students uh, feel that they feel the love and support. Uh, that I have for them um, in this environment. And so I, I think off the top of my head, I, I would say the mental health challenges, the range of them um, have been the most telling uh, aspect that I've seen from students in this environment. And I, I would add that, you know, to put that in context, you know, with Dr. Beatty, we've been his colleagues for many, many years. Um, and he it's a person that holds students to the highest um, standard a performance and um, prior to COVID um, was very much about teaching them to meet deadlines and to meet the particularities of an assignment. And so that adjustment really um, is an important, important adjustment. And I have had feedback from students that not all professors have um, made that adjustment. Um, there are many professors that take these kind of issues like mental health and the other things that are related to the, this pandemic, um, they try to treat the classroom environment online the same as they did um, prior to COVID. And so for some of our colleagues, when students are presenting these kinds of challenges, they treat it as them just engaging in the usual finesse of not meeting their obligations. And I've been amazed at the number of students who have um, tuned into class, but have told me they are working. Um, and so sometimes they're dipping out of their job as a waitress or other kinds of jobs and taking classes um, in, in their cars or in a, a private closet somewhere where they're trying to balance meeting economic obligation, whether it's because family members have taken ill and they have had to step up their economic contributions to their family. And I think um, certain people in economic positions in this society are so less sensitive to the majority of the people who are struggling or who struggled um, prior to the one or two times that people were given um, COVID relief um, from the government, people who are comfortable or who are in jobs where they don't have to go out and meet the public, unlike many people of color who were bus drivers or working at the grocery store or those kind of public facing jobs, um, have not been as sensitive to the economic plight, the struggle that our students 
are facing, their families are facing, and many of them have been called upon to um, contribute to their families. So, but in addition to that, um, stepping down a step below the mental health issues, I really think people underestimate how much human to human react um, interaction, um, how important that is. And the community bonds on the HBCU are really a major part of the experience because these campuses have always been under-resourced um, from the national government and state government. We've always had to make a way out of no way. And one of the intangibles has been the bonds, um, the networking, the family, the sense of family that was built, um, that compensated in some ways for those lack of physical resources and other resources that our institutions often find themselves deprived of. And so those um, interactions are so critically important to a part of the education experience. And I think we've gained a greater appreciation of how important those bonds are that it's a family. Let's uh, let's look at that, uh, Lethia. And in fact, we're going to uh, uh, pause for a moment. And when we resume, uh, Kathy, I hope you will lead us in a conversation and maybe share some of your experiences because of of us, I think you have been the one who uh, has been uh, the most uh, the most required to be on campus during this pandemic. So uh, we're going to take a pause, and when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation on in person versus remote learning students uh, at HBCUs and our institutions, and we'll talk more about that and, and several related issues. Back in a moment. Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Pull up a chair, take your seat at the Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table on the Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr here with our HBCU Master Teachers Roundtable, Mario Beatty, Lethia Watkins, and Catherine Adams. And we're talking about the impact of COVID uh, in the current landscape of higher ed in general, HBCUs in particular, and K-12. Uh, when we left, Mario and Lethia had uh, laid out many of the challenges facing our students and how it has adjusted our work as teachers and educators, particularly at Black colleges. Um, Kathy, you have taught both above and below the Mason-Dixon line. You've taught outside the continental United States, University of the West Indies. Um, like the rest of us, we worked at public and private schools, uh, historically white schools and historically black schools. But your experience at Claflin, I think, distinguishes ours at Howard and so many of our colleagues, particularly at HBCUs. You've been in person for a great deal of this time back and forth. Could you help us kind of tease out some of the things that Mario and Belithia opened out, up with in terms of this 
faces, the, the challenges facing our students, and also the challenges facing us as teachers, and perhaps even some of the tensions that we have, because administrators don't always get the memo, they have other priorities. But but let us know, because you've been in, the, you've been literally in the classroom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to co-sign on everything that um, that Mario and Valethea were stating. And um, certainly to talk about, even just today, we saw emails requesting uh, or telling students about um, the increase in accommodations that they have to apply for those every uh, semester that those don't carry over from one semester to the next. And so those issues, the increase in accommodations, um, students um, certainly trying to get in education however they can from their cars, from those closets, um, those small offices on their work site. And, um, and I think for me, I just wanted to um, also mention that this was the first time that I got a chance to see COVID on the screen. We had um, a, a kind of hybrid system. Initially, we were required to be in the classroom and there were small numbers of students that were allowed back to campus at Claflin, um, particularly because Orangeburg is such a small city that it is um, easily overrun with COVID cases and the infrastructure can't support the, um, the, the two major HBCUs that are in Orangeburg. And, um, and so I had some students that were on campus that were kind of um, sent home very quickly. And um, uh, if they tested positive, without regard to um, what might be the best way to integrate them back into their homes and communities. Um, that's been a concern. I've seen COVID on the screen for students who are still trying to um, not get lost in classes. And so they may have conducted, I mean, they may have contracted COVID and they'll come on with their cameras off. And then after class is over, those students will turn their cameras on so that I can see them. And um, it's been very disheartening to see young people um, experiencing those symptoms and maybe just a little bit of fear behind their eyes in terms of what that means. I think even for the students who are not asking for accommodations, not expressing any mental health issues, and maybe um, on the campus, as many were this past um, fall semester, very sometimes subtle changes and sometimes not subtle changes in focus and concentration, just the ability to get through a book from end to end, I think has been difficult for me as a professor. And so it allows me to be really sensitive to how I can model for my students um, ways in which to, um, to share the load of work and to work through some of those focus uh, challenges. And, um, and I, I just wanted to say something. I'm, I'm glad, uh, Greg, that you mentioned about those tensions because there are two things that are of great concern to me. It's one is the way in which the campus, the HBCU on campus experience is being curated during COVID. Hmm. So there is this, like, we're going to have homecoming, we're going to have these activities. And in some ways, students wanting to connect are showing up to those events, but maybe we're not really focusing in on some of the, um, some of the intellectual capacities and ways in which we can be using that sense of community to help bolster um, what students can do to not only kind of survive through this moment, but also to build new capacities. And, um, and so 
is kind of curating a campus experience that doesn't, it has very little mention of the intellectual work and how we can be flexible around those things. And, um, and then some of it is just kind of gotcha politics. You know, like um, I refer to it as gotcha politics because it's like we make students um, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's an issue that we need to provide an accommodation for. And, um, and then there are some students that are falling through the cracks in that so that the student who doesn't have COVID but may have had a parent or a grandparent pass from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, the student who may just be fearful of being in a classroom where we talk about spacing three feet and that's the CDC guideline. But mentally, I've been in some of those classrooms where they say, well, we space the chairs out three feet apart. But when the bodies are in the seats, mm -hmm. um, just I can tell that I leave the classroom with just a slight headache. And I think in the background, my brain is looking at all of those bodies in the chairs. And um, and sometimes they um, just look like this is not three feet. Yes. And so if I'm thinking that, I know the students are thinking that. And there are very few accommodations for the student that says, I want to be on campus. I want to be in the dormitory. I need that Wi-Fi because a lot of students from Claflin are from rural communities. And it doesn't matter if you send them a hotspot, they may not have very good cell phone coverage. So a hotspot's not gonna help them. Mm -hmm. Campus will help them, but being in the classroom, um, being forced into the classroom when we have technologies like they could access Zoom from their classroom and still have access to the resources um, that we haven't quite caught up with a, um, I think a, uh, a response that is is allowing students to feel comfortable in asking for the myriad of things that they need, knowing that there'll be an affirmative response. That's interesting, Kat. I mean, and, and, and a little bit later on, we're going to talk about what uh, we think our students and what the data is showing us students may or may not be uh, losing in terms of their academic progress, their intellectual growth. Um, and as you talk about it, Valithi, you know, it reminds me, I mean, uh, you've taught in the community uh, colleges of Chicago and we see that the st that our faculty colleagues K-12 in Chicago have said they're not going back in the classroom <laughs> until <laughs> these kind of these kind of safety measures are are introduced. And the mayor of Chicago has said they're engaging in legal work stoppage action. But, but that having been said, you know, how do we approach these very real questions of lack of technology, lack of access, and, and how do we connect that with, uh, you know, as a recent study, Fayetteville University uh, polled students and almost all of them, 90 percent, said they were worried or extremely worried uh, about how COVID was impacting the institution. They're very worried that 60 percent of them said it may take two, three years for HBCUs to return to normal. But it sounds like even returning to what we were doing before COVID doesn't address the fact of what some of the things Kathy just raised in terms of the challenges, the very real challenges that existed pre-COVID in terms of this kind of bureaucratic process, not listening to educators, you know, perhaps diminishing or, or, or lowering the attention on intellectual development. You know, how, how do we address these these issues that have been laid bare by COVID, like this question of the intellectual development of students, the concerns of students, not just the emotional anxiety, but the even process of teaching and learning, things that we all knew existed before COVID, but COVID has now just exposed it and is, there's no place for it to, to, to hide. Yeah, balancing these different or competing interests is what we're being confronted with. Um, and a lot of these issues have been um, moving forward, like you say, accelerating what was already taking place. And what I mean by that, you know, early on, I, I must admit, I wasn't, you know, even though I served on a technology committee that um, evaluated applications by faculty members to um, turn their classes into hybrid courses or even to encourage them to create online core courses. Um, in the back of my mind, I was always concerned with the um, for-profit motive or intent that these were trends. I mean, 
I embrace the technology because I think there are benefits to it, but we have to balance them with human interest. And for some people who are being counters, who, who devalue what professors do, what we do in the classroom, what we bring, the intangibles, those people who develop assessment in ways that want to treat it just like uh, working on a, a factory assembly line and you could just count widgets, these intangible things that um, happen in education that you can't always count and measure in individual increments. Um, my concern was always that this was a trend like you see in grocery stores, that as you, you've seen the acceleration of ending jobs, of even cashiers, that so many grocery stores, whether it's Whole Foods or um, um, the local pharmacy, now um, you're, you're seeing these self-checkout. Um, and that's technology replacing human interaction, human jobs. And so frankly, I was concerned very early on that the use of technology was designed in a way to, to harness our expertise, what we bring to try to videotape it, to try to curate it in ways that then they could just always put in a tape, push play, mm -hmm. and eliminate you from the equation. That they were thinking about bringing in just low paid workers as really TAs and others to just grade papers and to use um, the technology to um, just replicate what they thought they were gonna be replicating the professor's expertise just by using tapes of the professor and, and being able to eliminate the professor from the equation. But I think one benefit of this experience, um, whether it's people at, through K through 12 or even at our level, the people are gaining a, an appreciation of the importance of teachers hmm. and what we bring. Um, and how we can impact and touch lives and change lives. We've all had our lives changed by a teacher. I remember my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Shelton, who invested so much in me, who gave me such a strong foundation. Uh, many of us can reach in our lives and talk about a teacher that has changed our lives. So in that regard, um, you know, what's happening in Chicago, for example, you know, I saw a debate um, from a parent who wanted um, the kids in the classroom versus a parent who say we needed a pause. It's this conversation about um, education is not the center, although people talk about what they're doing in terms of education at the center. The reality is they're saying these parents cannot get back to work unless these kids are in the classroom. And so it becomes about keeping corporation and economics going as opposed to are the children safe? We see an increase in young people um, having COVID. I'm talking about the K through 12 young people mm -hmm. having COVID. Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't a model be created to like the wealthy are doing to have small pods? Their education of their children have not been disrupted by the pandemic. That's right. Well, let me, it's let me, the education of your other people. Let me, in fact, that's a good place for us to take another pause. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of these disparities in academic growth. And, 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 you know, from here on in for the rest of the show, have, you know, have a, an exchange and a conversation about how these disparities exist and what we've been doing to try to address some of these things. So, uh, again, you're with our HBCU Educators Roundtable. This is The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr. Back in a minute.
am Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, we're continuing our Educators Roundtable, talking about COVID and education. And we're joined again with uh, Mario Beatty from Howard University, Valithia Watkins from Howard University, and Catherine Adams from Claflin. Uh, Valithia, you were talking about the impact that we see uh, K-12, when you mentioned Chicago. Um, Kat, you taught, you caught K-12 in Philadelphia, your hometown. I mean, and we all have very good friends and, and we've done administrative work and taught in the K-12 level. I mean, our colleagues are suffering. I mean, the students aren't just the only ones. Anybody have any thoughts about that? In terms uh, absolutely. I mean, just to pick up on um, you know, what Valithia was saying and, you know, what's going on in Chicago, the, you know, there are the issues of these economic considerations that are being pit against uh, health and safety considerations. Um, and kind of early on in, in the uh, COVID crisis, the health and safety considerations uh, were weighing out. It was clear that you know, we need to pause, we, you know, we need to go virtual yeah. for health and safety reasons. As vaccines have kicked in um, and the impact of those, uh, there, and, and then just time uh, itself, there is an increasing sentiment um, uh, both by uh, conservatives and liberals, that it's just time to get back uh, to work. Um, and as a professor, in this moment, I'm kind of in alignment with the Chicago teachers because I'm thinking, okay, you know, for the past two years, we've all been sold this dream that the vaccines <laughs> were going to help us to get control of this virus and help to get back to some semblance of normality. And I'm still waiting, <laughs> you know, I'm still waiting, you know? And so we're in the midst of, you know, a, a, the raging Omicron variant. And you're like, hold on. Like, okay, we've had two vaccines and everybody getting boosters and this stuff is off the chain. Man. <laughs> you know, and nobody has, no one has a good answer for this. And so you tell me as a teacher, you know, you're going to, you know, risk your health and safety. Mm. And in, a, in an environment, especially at the university level, um, there are things in terms of health and safety protocols that are set on paper that actually don't match the reality of what's actually being done. That's true, brother. In the schools. That's true. And, and teachers and professors see that. They note those contradictions. That's right. Um, and, you know, they want at, at Howard, at, everywhere, you know, we're constantly noting those contradictions. That's right. You know, and so professors and teachers are giving pause because they're not listening to words. They are looking at the reality That's that right. they experience That's right. in those classrooms and what is actually done. That's right. And so, you yeah. know, those teachers are taking a stance and trying to 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 say, look, we need to be absolutely clear that the health and safety of teachers is a priority. 
in but this. Those, and if you're not going to make it a priority, we're going to make sure that it's a priority. But mm-hmm. those teachers are not individual persons. What people don't realize, those teachers are parents. They're usually taking care of children, their own children, and mm-hmm. their parents or elders or other mm-hmm. sick members of their family. And so for them, the risk is not just as an individual, I may get COVID, but it's also if I get COVID and I'm the only person providing economics to this family, or I'm taking care of my elderly mother or husband or my sick child, then that's a whole network of family members that are in trouble. So um, I I guess I would ask Dr. Carr or Kathy, what do you think about um, the conversation that early on people were saying, we're not going back. See, I don't think society has accepted we're not going back to what, right. and that's what was was so great to go back to. Right. Um, yeah. Is this you know, normal that we need to create new systems to deal with a new normal? Or what are we going yeah. back to? What are we rushing to get back to that was so great? Mm-hmm. I I want to I want to respond to that um, in some ways that are where we really are thinking about what's best for our communities and. Um, I had an opportunity over the summer to work with some young uh, seven-year-olds. And um, this was through the Every Black Girl um, program uh, put together by Vivian Anderson here in Columbia, South Carolina. And Vivian decided that uh, she would open up her space. She usually works with high school uh, girls And because of COVID, there were lots of parents saying, I've got to go back to work. Can you, um, can can I bring my children to you? And so she got some computers and opened her space up to children of all ages and, um, and decided from seeing what was going on that she would start to pull together some small groups of, of children and um, Monique Bing is the young woman that she charged with um, with putting together this program. And I took material that um, car that you have put out there around the black curriculum. Um, very helpful. Monique was like, can you come and teach Africana studies to seven year olds? <laughs> and I had a ball. Mm-hmm. It was a pod. Right. And it was this way in which it was a moment to look at what were some of the deficiencies for those young people and bringing in people every day of the week because their parents are working Monday through Friday. And so Monday through Thursday, it was bringing in someone that was going to help with skills not just intellectual skills. These young women, uh, these young girls were taught yoga, they were taught how to manage their emotions. We taught, uh, I taught them Africana studies and someone was working on their reading skills because they saw that there was a little bit of a lag with that. And then the rest of us reinforced it. And then on Fridays, they took them on um, field trips. And what was done in five weeks with those girls was amazing. Uh, So much to the point that I told my students in the fall, everybody is responsible for teaching someone. Mm. Maybe in a formal setting, maybe in an informal setting, but your cousins, your younger sisters, brothers, someone in your community should know some of the things that we taught you this semester. So I'm really excited um, in many ways to get back uh, this January to find out what my students did over the break in terms of just conveying some of this information to young people in their own lives. Because I think that in the same way that, um, uh, you know, I think Valethea was, was right. And how, are, how can we support places in our community that can provide some spaces that would alleviate some of that pressure for teachers? Mm-hmm. Um, that would alleviate some of that pressure for parents? And um, and how will we fund those projects? Um, how can we pour in 
to um, those kinds of spaces with all the things that we've ever done in teaching black studies in our communities over time. That's um, there are enough curricula out there for us to replicate that in very small groups um, so that our college students better understand what we're teaching them because they are teaching it to someone younger than themselves. Mm. Um, so I think that there are some ways that you're right. We're not going back to the ways in which they thought, but I think we can be creative and um, and take the best of what we've done in the past to craft a very different um, and better future that is um, something that is still intellectually rigorous mm -hmm. and um, and also safe because a lot of those spaces, especially in K through 12, were not safe for our kids um, with yeah, some wait. people who did not have our kids in, you know, in mind. That's true. Well, well when we come back, we were going to turn to that. Ask that's perfect, uh, Ken. I mean, we've got two, two of our colleagues in Atlanta, Morehouse School of Medicine, Reba Kelsey and, and Maggie Ridge. And as we know, Maggie is a pediatric uh, doctor. They're talking about this this rush of children in uh, co with COVID coming into the the, the, uh, the the hospitals, and we know black children have accounted for twenty percent of those who've lost a parent to COVID through early twenty twenty one, despite only being fourteen percent of, of the population in the country. Um, but you've just given us a window into possibilities, uh, learning possibilities that we can have going forward. And when you say community. And when you say community, I mean, it's going to require us to recover some things we may have uh, conveniently forgotten and maybe sacrificed on the altar of capitalism. But we, we're back. We're back in a second and uh, we will turn toward those solutions. Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice 
to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with Roland all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man. <laughs> Owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Back at the Black Table with our HBCU Educators Roundtable, uh, Lethe Watkins, Mario Beatty, and Catherine Adams. And uh, when we uh, paused for a second, uh, Dr. Adams was uh, introducing to us one of the innovations that has come during COVID there in South Carolina based on her years as a, as a master teacher and educator curriculum developer. Okay, y'all, we, we've all we've all participated in writing curriculum, some things we've done together. We've taken students abroad. We've done any number of things. In knowing you all and listening to how you've approached this, uh, these challenges over the last couple of years, uh, what are some of the, for lack of a better term, positives in terms of things we can maybe recover, retool, remember, and apply? You just You just gave us one incredible example there with what you all are doing with these young people and particularly the young girls. Uh, anybody else want to let us know some of the things that you've learned and perhaps we should be able to share and then maybe even address or confront administrations in higher education in general, HBCs in particular and K-12 included to say, look, find the money for this, move in this direction. What do y'all think? Any Some of the things you learned, uh, positive things. Well, I think for me, um, well, I will say, going back to um, a point uh, Kathy made earlier in the conversation uh, in terms of accommodations with students, um, and this goes to the spirit of a, of a of a professor, and that means, of course, uh, when you hear accommodations, that means the students go through usually some entity like student services on campus. Uh, they submit their uh, the issues, and then they, and then student services communicates with uh, the professors, and the professors uh, then use that documentation to provide um, students with some type of uh, extension, uh, timeline, kind of special accommodations to complete work. Well, the common sense of the professor needs to kick in, mm. and to override, like that means that students that don't have um, formal documentation for accommodations. In this environment, I've been flexible with virtually any student that has said that, look, this is what's going on in, in my life. They may not feel that it's as serious enough to go through student services um, to get accommodations, but my common sense is like, okay, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, and I'm <laughs> going to support you. And, and, and to me, that's the power of the professor. Mm. That's the power of the professor to override the system. And I think that professors have to use their power and their common sense in their way, looking at this dynamic um, and to act accordingly um, in this system. So you don't have to always be subservient to the, the system as it impacts your course. Um, in terms of what, you know, I've kind of learned in my class uh, teaching virtually, the big thing that was missing was community. And I like to try to create community in my classes. Mm -hmm. um, it's Black Studies. Um, and it's grounded in that idea. And so how 
I try to do that is the first two days of class, I use the breakout room feature in Zoom. And I just randomly put students together and just have them introduce themselves and talk. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the balance of the, those classes mm. is just trying to build community among students in a very isolating environment. Mm. And I think that becomes very, very helpful um, for the remainder of the course because they begin to help each other. They know who each other uh, are. Uh, and they can exchange information in terms of work. The, you know, the other thing, I've done a lot of things, but the other thing um, uh, that I've done is I use a discussion post in Blackboard, um, mm-hmm. and I have students to respond to readings, to lectures, to videos, et cetera, you know, give five important points to have them to write something. But I am most importantly, I also have them to ask at least one question Mm. upon about what they read or view. And I curate those questions and I use those questions to formulate my lecture and discussion. And I'm literally responding to those individual students. I'm letting them know that I see you, that I hear you, that I observe that you're reading and engaging in the course. And as a professor, I'm going to answer your question directly and show its importance in the large arc of the content that I am teaching in the class. So what I'm trying to do with that is to form a, just another bridge of intimacy. Um, with the student to, to get them to, to, to buy into the experience and to connect with me and to connect with the material. So almost they're just self-motivated to go through the material. He's like, okay, this professor is listening and talking to me. When students hear that and feel that from a professor, you can take a students anywhere that you want them to go. Absolutely. Anywhere. Absolutely. That's so that has to be foundational to me. You have to connect with the spirit of your students. Yes. Yes. That's what I try to do. And once I connect to them, then we can take off. That's interesting. You said it more because I mean, that that balances out. Uh, there's some research that's showing that uh, COVID rates are lower at some of the HBCUs like North Carolina and T, some of the Georgia HBCUs, because the COVID rules have been more strictly enforced at some of the HBCUs than PWIs. But rather than that kind of kind of martial kind of militaristic approach, that that type of connecting, even virtually, that's a very powerful counterbalance to that and kind of gets us back to this question of, of what we can do to enhance. Um, there are a couple of other things and I want everybody to, 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 to jump in on, on this as well. Um, you know, there are real material challenges. Y'all have all raised them. You know, our students are looking for funding. We know the federal government did the funding to HBCUs. You see a lot of loan forgiveness going on and, but you know, still the, the gap remains. We're, um, we're part of it. I'm part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of them. To <laughs> be right, it's like, exactly. It's they They're, are me. They, I know that's right. <laughs> but you know, I mean, this. You know, what does the future pretend? The immediate future, like the next two, three, four, five years, and then going forward in terms of students' abilities to 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 even enter higher ed, particularly our HBCUs. Are you concerned about the future of some of some of our HBCUs in the wake of COVID? Um, the learning gap, the gap in learning, seems like y'all are addressing it individually, but what can we do at the institutional level in, in terms of formations to try to kind of address some of these challenges that aren't on the horizon that are here right now? Right. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm definitely concerned because, I mean, my student loan debt came when I was a doctoral student. Mm-hmm. You know, I virtually had no debt as an undergraduate student. You know, mm-hmm. so these students are incurring lots of debt um, at the undergraduate level um, that's following them. 
And somehow in this kind of capitalistic environment, you know, we blame the students. Oh, these students, you know, uh, you took out all of these loans, you got to repay society. But we should not think of it like that. You know, it, that means that we have shifted from my era and the era before me. We have basically shifted the economic burden of education from the state to the student. Mm. And these that are had, public policy Absolutely. Decisions. These are public you policy know. decisions that have happened that or choices. Sh- should these be are reversed. Choices. Absolutely. Because- I think in this regards, when we look at uh, African-Americans, in some respects, um, student loan debt, the disproportionate amount of student loan debt, we can look at it as modern day sharecropping. Hmm. You know, rather than using education and these opportunities to lift our communities up into home ownership and into um, economic um, situations that we can pass on to another generation, this debt creates a ceiling that... um, keeps you at a material level that you're fa- it's just like our families who were on the farm sharecropping on the plantation. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a real choice because the generations before us did not have this amount of debt. There was an investment in public education. There was an investment, um, not, and, and of course, HBCUs didn't experience that level of investment, um, but you're investing in the future. And so, Students should not have this amount of debt, and that's a public policy choice. Um, so if you want to talk about reparations, provide quality exactly. education, and investing in quality education is one of the major forms of reparation um, mm-hmm. that we could have in this country. Yeah. And, and getting rid of that debt shouldn't be linked in this kind of neoliberal kind of fashion to uh, looking at what students study, you know, Oh, um, or want to study, you know, this kind of Obama-esque, you know, kind of approach um, that HBCUs and HBCU presidents railed against, you know, mm-hmm. um, when he was in office. And certainly I didn't support one bit um, in, in this idea, uh, you know, that certain disciplines are worth more than others. And mm-hmm. this idea that the market, you know, should should drive you know, graduation rates. And those are the things that we should be investing in. And we should be investing in the the dreams of our students because all of these disciplines are needed for a holistic, healthy, functioning society. And so we should not be playing these types of of games um, where we value, uh, you know, uh, some disciplines more than others. Um, in an yeah. economic sense, mm-hmm. you know, those types of games are and and, per, and really that's what assessment has boiled down to. Yeah. It is yeah. basically a not so thinly veiled um, cover for basically institutions making e- economic decisions on market decisions based upon their assessment of disciplines. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I agree. Not only should we just wipe away this debt um, because it's absurd. We can just wipe it off the books. They don't owe anybody. It's not like that someone loaned them the money out of their pocket hmm. <laughs> and they're waiting for the repayment of the loan. It, it, it's, it's, all, it's all digital. It's all arbitrary. And, and I think of my students, um, you know, like that room, that opportunity in the classroom, we're planting seeds. And so I, I know that all the students on my campus need exposure to Africana studies, regardless absolutely. of their major. Yeah, they absolutely. all need to be thinking creatively, thinking differently. They need to be building their networks so that as some student that may be uh, a STEM graduate or a business graduate or education, that they are thinking about my majors in Africana studies, when they are putting together teams of people to work on things. Uh, I had a very recent uh, uh, Claflin graduate. She graduated with a degree in biology. She was working in a lab in, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And she reached out to me for a letter of recommendation. And she said, you know, I have all the things that I need from 
the STEM faculty, but your class in African-American heritage really helped me think differently around diversity issues. And so I would like a letter of recommendation from you um, to complete my, my packet. And so we have information that is going to be valuable for having a cohort a generation of young people think differently. And I think that we not only have to have them in our classrooms, we have to think about how do we get this content to um, to students broadly who are not in our classrooms. Um, one of the things that I have suggested for our uh, department at Claflin is, um, and, it's, and, and it has been well received to start doing more professional development with public school teachers because some of them have some really great ideas, um, but may need that kind of added support of a certificate program or just some additional books to read or some of the latest scholarship around how to enhance their curriculum around what they're doing. And I think it's an exchange. Um, some of the things that I've learned from sec first and second grade teachers um, around what they're doing with young people uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the ways in which uh, just again with those seventh graders, we do a timeline in the African-American heritage class that students have to figure out an actual timeline in which they insert themselves. I did the same thing with the seven, um, seven year olds where they did a timeline with post-it notes <laughs> and, you know, just some blue painter's tape on the wall. And that was the timeline where they got to insert themselves and then also mm -hmm. events that were related to Africana history. And, um, and so I think that um, we, we really do have an opportunity to be imaginative, to be creative, um, and maybe to do what we've always done, which is to do it on fewer, um, fewer resources mm -hmm. than, um, than other things. But I think at the same time, we should be <laughs> demanding um, a redistribution of resources because we see through this pandemic mm -hmm. that there, there is money there. Yes, <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> Lots of money there, but, um, but we have to call, we have to demand for the redistribution of those funds. Well, 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 well thank you, Kathy. And I think that's a wonderful way for us to pause for now. Um, here at the Black Table. Uh, this has been a bit of a tease, I must confess. Uh, this topic is timely, it's important as our young people and all of our teachers are in our communities are struggling around this issue of education and the pandemic. Uh, but I say it's a tease because this is just the opening conversation of many more to come, not only with uh, Drs. Beatty, Adams and Watkins, but with many more of our colleagues uh, because we often are reminded by one of our colleagues, Jules Harrell at Howard University, that a university and education in general is really the students and the teachers and everybody else is there to support that learning enterprise. And so you've gotten a peek at the HBCU uh, teachers, the HBCU Master Teachers Roundtable that will be a regular uh, feature here at the Black Table. So thank you, Dr. Watkins. Thank you, Dr. Beatty. Thank you, Dr. Adams for helping us with this inaugural conversation and, and we'll We'll join up again soon to continue on another topic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network.
I'll, I'll clear the table this way. We, we usually end uh, our uh, time together with a clearing the table comment. Uh, we know that recently um, we marked the transition in the ancestorhood of the great Sidney Poitier, uh, that son of the Caribbean who we know best as a film actor in Hollywood. One of the films he made was a, a film called To Serve With Love. Uh, to serve with love, the story of a teacher, a black teacher in England, teaching East End students, poor working class white students who fell in love not only with his mind, but with his commitment to their learning. Uh, a lot of people might not know that that uh, film, To Serve with Love, was based on a novel, actually, a novel by a brother who was an HBCU master teacher himself, Eustace Edward Ricardo Braithwaite, Braith, E.R. Braithwaite who was from Guyana, who lived to the age of 104, actually made transition in 2016. And Professor Braithwaite, after watching To Serve With Love said, you know, something didn't quite translate in the film. He was from Guyana. He had a master's degree from Cambridge, couldn't get a job in England. So he took up teaching, even though he had been trained in engineering, one of those STEM fields. He could not find his way into the profession. Initially, he was part of that generation that folks call the Windrush generation. Those of you watching from the UK know what I'm talking about. Those black immigrants who came from the Caribbean and rebuilt England after World War II, who had precarious positions, uh, who found themselves in a precarious position in that, in that, in that society in England. Uh, but I raise that because Sidney Poitier, who portrayed that teacher into Sir With Love, has, is widely credited in that film with showing you know, how to build interracial bridges. But there was another film where Sidney Poitier played a reluctant teacher, he and Bill Cosby. That was a film called The Piece of the Action, where they were uh, in Chicago teaching young people in a community center on the realities of life and how to acquire that education and use it to improve their lives. And as we close this uh, edition, as we clear the table, the black table, and prepare for our next time together, uh, we've been reminded by three of the best teachers there are in the world that community, that compassion, that commitment to deep intellectual work can never and must never be displaced as the foundation for education. So thanks y'all for joining us and uh, we will see you again on the Black Star Network with the Black Table next session. <laughs>